Good morning. We're thankful to see everyone here with us today. Now, Ken, we do have one problem. I can't carry over this afternoon because uh, we're going to have to do the same thing this afternoon. They're going to have a 2 o'clock service as well, so we're going to have to cut our Sunday afternoon service a little bit short also. And you gotta love electronics. Right now, let's see if it, there it is. Oh, well, that's the reason it took me a minute to get back. I went and grabbed my phone. If I have to, I've got it, the sermon on my phone as well, just harder to read. So I was gonna make do one way or the other. You would be turning your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter five. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44. We'll take our lesson from there this morning. I want to continue to remember those who have COVID and who have other ailments and issues that they're dealing with this morning. The reason David, his family is not with us today. I want to continue to remember David, Alexis, and I don't remember who all else has got it, but I do remember those are the latest ones that has been uh, made known to us. So we need to keep them in our prayers. Today we're going to be studying a sermon entitled Overcoming Hatred. Now I know we don't think a lot about that as mu or maybe as much as we should. Maybe we do think about it. But I think a lot of us put things in the back of our minds and we don't think about things that are going on in the world. We know the Bible says don't hate. And we think, well, I'm a Christian, I don't hate people. But we need to take a very serious look at our lives because... Deep down, we probably are guilty of this at times and we don't even know it. The reason I say that is we watch the news and we see bad things happen. And we're going to get into this more as the lesson goes on. But we see bad things happen. And we form an opinion of what we think should happen to the person who commits either a heinous crime or uh, they, they do something they shouldn't do. Now, they should be punished, absolutely. Absolutely. And we're to hate the sin that is done in this world. We're not to hate the sinner, the person committing the sin, because we should want them to change their lives and ultimately be saved. We live in a, a world today where there is a hatred of sin, and sin causes many atrocities in this world. It has in the past. It continues to cause them even now. I was reading an article this weekend about a, bro a man who hired his brother to kill his ex-wife. He offered his brother a motorcycle and some money if he'd kill his ex-wife. Now, it wasn't his current wife, his ex-wife. They already divorced. It was already over with. But he had such a hatred in his heart toward her that he wanted her dead. The brother ended up committing that act and, and killing her. Now, this was in 2017. It happened in Alabama. But it was in 2017. Back in December, they finally arrested the husband. They got enough on him to arrest him. They still haven't caught the brother that actually committed the act. Of murder. He is in the wind somewhere hiding. Eventually, he very likely will be found and brought to justice. But it's that kind of hatred in the world that we see going on today that's costing people their lives, it's hurting people's lives, whether physically, emotionally, mentally, and it's causing all kinds of problems that we need to try to overcome in our lives and make sure that we don't have that same issue. Leviticus 19.17 says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Let's look at our text at Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44. He said, You have heard it said, Thou shalt love thine enemy, or shalt love thy neighbor rather, and hate thine enemy. Now Jesus does a lot of comparing and contrasting in, in the Sermon on the Mount, particularly here in Matthew 5. You've heard it said, In times past, these are the things that we've followed. You love your brethren, you love your neighbor, you love those who do good to you, but we hate our enemies. Now look at verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. It's the very opposite of what the world says. The world says if somebody does me wrong, I've got to hate them. The Bible says, no, you love them. When they mistreat you, you don't 
get revenge and you get, get back at them. You love them. You do good to them. Paul tells us why. Romans chapter 12. For in doing so you shall heap coals of fire on their head. Show that we don't stoop to their level. I heard that enough growing up. I got tired of hearing it. Somebody do something to me, I said, I'll get them. And Mom or Dad would always say, no, you don't stoop to their level. You'd be a better person. So as we get into our lesson this morning, there are several things we want to discuss, although very briefly, we're going to discuss a few issues. Those who have overcome hatred hate sin. That's what we're supposed to do. God hates sin, but we're to love the sinner. If you look in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, the proverb writer wrote, These six things doth the Lord hate. So the Lord does hate some things. Yea, seven are abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that are swift in running to mischief. A false witness that speaks lies. And he that soweth discord among brethren. God hates the sin. But he loves the sinner, and that's what he teaches us to do. In Romans chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, it says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him. When we die to sin, we die to hatred and any other sin that we've committed in our lives. We put those things behind us. And so once we become a Christian, there's no room in our heart for hatred. Now God still wants us to hate the sin. In Psalm 97, 10, it says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the soul of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hands of the wicked. In Amos chapter 5, verse 15, Amos wrote, hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment at the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Hate evil, but love the good. Now in explaining how it is possible to hate what a man does, but not hate the man, C.S. Lewis explained it this way, and he said, and I quote, it occurred to me that there was one man for whom I had been doing this all my life, myself. So we may hate what we do sometimes. We won't want to hate ourselves. And if we can think about it from that standpoint, we may hate what a friend does or what a family member does. But we don't hate them. We want them to change. So we need to be careful that we don't transfer our hate for the sin to the individual person who may be the sinner. Now next, when overcoming hatred, we acknowledge the nature of hate. Hate is a characteristic of the unregenerate state of mankind. When you look in Titus chapter 3 and verse 3, Titus wrote, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, and notice the next word, hateful, and hating one another. In times past, he said, we were hateful. We hated other people or hated one another. But we don't do that anymore because that was in times past. That was prior to becoming Christian. And there's no room in the Christian's life for hate for the person. We're not to be hateful. And I almost snicker at that because we teach about hate. Let's don't hate people. But how many people that we see that call themselves Christians are actually hateful people? They may say, well, I don't hate anybody. We use that word hate or hateful sometimes. Oh, don't be hateful to me. I mean, don't mistreat me. Don't try to harm me. Don't do something bad to me. It goes along with hating the person. If we do something bad to a person, whether realized or not, we're showing hate. That's why I said we have to, as Christians, 
think about our own lives because whether we realize it or not, we're all guilty of this at times because of our human nature and not just human nature. We can't just blame it on that really, but the world around us. We see other people doing that and we see it enough, then we start doing that and we don't even think a lot about it. But we can become hateful and we can hate one another. Hatred is also considered among the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. And all of this list, and I want you to think about this, hatred is associated with adultery, with fornication, with murder, with lasciviousness, with drunkenness, and all the other vices that Paul lists in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. And in verse 21, he even said, those which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You want to go to heaven one day? Don't do these things. And hate is listed among them. Hatred is harbored only by fools. Proverb writer tells us. In Proverbs 10, 18, He that hideth hatred with lying lips, and he that uttereth slander is a fool. We try to hide hatred by lying about it. He said we're foolish or we're a fool. We also have to remember that hatred is cruel. Psalm 25, 19, the psalmist said, Consider mine enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. Have you ever had someone hate or despise you so much that they wanted to harm you, either physically, emotionally, or cause you problems in your life? Probably every single one of us had at one point in our life. I don't think there's a person here that couldn't say that, oh yeah, no, nobody's ever done that to me. It might have been in childhood, maybe teenage years, it could be adulthood, but at some point in our life we've had someone that was an enemy that hated us and wanted to do us harm one way or the other. In his cruelty, hatred led to the murder of Abel. You think about that. Because of Cain's jealousy, he hated his brother and he murdered him. Well, one thing we need to realize and think about that hatred is really just evidence of immaturity. The boys and I we were out yesterday. We were going and doing some looking around some different things, enjoying ourselves. Finally had a, other than I went back to work couple weeks ago, but other than work, I haven't really done a whole lot since my surgery. So we got out, we did some things, and we came across this guy, I was talking to him, he looked like he was in his 40s, he had his hat cocked a little bit sideways, and the bill turned up, he was cool. And I told the boys, I said, yo, a guy was a nice guy, I liked talking to him. I said, he's a 40-something year old teenager. Yeah, some people grow up in age, but they don't grow up in maturity. <laughs> Not to say that he is immature, but he just acted like a 40-something-year-old teenager. Now, I know we all, as we get older, want to feel young, buddy, and act young, and think we're, we're young. Somebody told me the other day, he said, oh, in my mind, I feel like I'm 20 years old again. Well, in my mind, I do too, but I know that I can't do what I did when I was 20. And the older I get, the, uh, the worse it becomes. And I've heard people say that for years, and now I'm starting to realize it more and more. Things slow down. It's harder to, to do things, get over things, but we have to understand that we have to be mature in what we do. In Matthew 5, once again, verses 43 through 48, we've already read 43 and 44, and for sake of time, because we're running out of time, I'm going to skip those two verses because we have already read them. But he said that, Ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh the Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven which is perfect. Now he's not talking about sinless here. He's talking about maturity, completeness. We need to be mature enough that we love our enemies. We do good to them. We don't mistreat them even though they mistreat us. We don't say, what can I do to get back at them? We love them and treat them with respect and honor and dignity. Again, that word perfect in our text is from the Greek word 
teleos, which does mean mature. Hence, to be mature means to love, not hate our enemies. Next, the failure in overcoming hatred leads to so many more evils in this world. When we have hate in our heart, it stirs up trouble. In Proverbs 10, 12, it says, Hatred stirreth up strife, but love covereth all sins. The strife that was generated back in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 37 between Joseph and his brothers was generated from the heart. In Genesis 37, 4 and 5, we can read, And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren. And they hated him yet the more. And what did they seek to do? They wanted to kill him. We see congregations oftentimes who are struggling with turmoil and problems, strife in the congregation because of brethren. And instead of having love for one another and trying to work things out, people want their own way and they get mad and they cause more problems. And that's not what we should be doing. We should love one another, not hate, detest, or despise one another, not wish ill will toward anyone. We should want the best for everyone. And those in sin, we should want them to repent and come back to Christ so they can go to heaven. We shouldn't want them to be lost if they've mistreated us. Hate also, also generates envy, and envy generates hate. I mentioned that Joseph's brothers hated him, Genesis 37, 8. And they envied him, Genesis 37, 11. And as a result of that, the brothers wanted to kill him. They just wanted him dead. They threw him in the pit and they were trying to figure out what to do. And one brother said, let's just kill him. Had to do away with it for good. They finally decided, no, we're not going to do that. He's our brother. Hate hey, also leads to murder and assassination. And that's what they wanted to do to Joseph. Absalom hated Amnon, and he killed him. We can read over in 2 Samuel 13, 21 through 29. It was a sin of hatred that had Jesus crucified. The Jews hated him so much because they didn't like his message that they put him on the cross. They murdered him, and it was all out of hatred because they wanted a physical king that was going to come in and knock the Romans off their perch. So the Jews could be the worldwide great powerful nation and rule the world. And when Jesus showed them that his kingdom was not of this world and that wasn't the purpose of him coming, they wanted him dead. And they succeeded in that for a very brief, brief time till his resurrection. In 1 John 3, 15, the Bible says, Whoso hated his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. When we have hate, it's no different than murder. We get upset when we see murder and we see it on the news every single day, especially in this area. And we think that those people need to be brought to justice, and they do. But when we have hate, or if we have hate in our heart, it's no different than if we pulled a gun out and shot somebody and killed them. It's the same as murder. Hate also leads to the sin of the tongue. David said in Psalm 109, verse 3, They compass me about with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. No reason to fight against him, but because they hated him, they fought against him. Solomon said in Proverbs 26, 24, He that hateth dissembleth with lips. In verse 28, he said, A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it. Hate also leads to bitterness, resentment, retaliation. Over in Romans 12, 14, the Bible says, Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. That should be our attitude. Because it's important to remember that when we render evil for evil, it's devilish. When we render good for good, it's really human. It's what God expects all of us to do. But there are also consequences if we don't overcome hatred. Hatred will rob us of our happiness. As long as a person hates another, they're going to be miserable. Someone once said that hate and hell all dwell in the same heart. If I were going to knock on the door of the most miserable man in town, I know exactly where I'd go. The door 
that behind it lies bitterness, resentfulness, and an unforgiving heart. Something else we may not realize is hate makes us a slave. When we hate someone, they control our thoughts and our dreams. You think about it. When we have a problem with a person, and it may not even be that we hate them, we think about that situation, hopefully wanting to rectify it. But if we think about it in terms of what can I do to get back at them, we have hate in our heart whether we realize it or not. And you realize that they have won over us at that point because they have consumed us. They've become over us because that's all we can think about. We can't think about getting on with life because we've got to think about what can I do to get back at this person. That's why we don't need hate in our heart. Hating someone will require us to take medicines for indigestion, headaches, and even loss of energy because people have hate often will have sleepless nights just sitting up thinking about that person they hate. If you want to be a slave to someone, find someone to hate, and you'll be a slave to them. Hate can harm us physically. Men sometimes think that it pays to hate, and they later learn that they must pay for the hate. Dr. S.I. McMillan speaks of jealousy, enviness, and self-centeredness, rage and resentment as a, as a disease-producing emotions. And he says, what a person eats is not as important as the bitter spirit, the hate, and the feelings of guilt that eat at him. But sadly, and more importantly, hate keeps us out of heaven. Hate is one of those works of the flesh that we talked about in Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, that tells us it will keep us out of heaven. 1 John 3, 15, we've already read that, that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. And hate is the same as murder. But what can we do about it? How can we overcome it? We can overcome it by having the proper love in our heart, not only toward God, but toward our fellow man that the Bible teaches us and commands us to have. With the Bible writers, there's no middle ground between love and hate. It's got to be one or the other. In 1 John 2, 9 through 11... He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even till now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So love gets us in the light but hate keeps us in the darkness. Can't be a little bit of both. Just think about the necessity of love. Brotherly love is a command. John 15, verse 12. We're commanded to love our brethren. It's a badge of discipleship. Jesus said in John 13, 35, that we know that we're his disciples if we have love one toward another. In Matthew 22, 39, we're told that love is the second greatest commandment. First is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. The second is to love your neighbor as yourself. So love is really the first commandment, but loving God, but loving our fellow man is the second greatest commandment. That's brotherly love. Brotherly love is also the fulfilling of the law. If we have love to one another, we will do what the law tells us. Not only man's law, but more importantly, God's law. What is the nature of the love that we're to have for our brethren? We're to love our brethren as the Lord loved us. John 13, 34. We're to love our brethren as ourselves. We mentioned just a minute ago in Matthew 22, 39. We're to love our brethren fervently as we read in 1 Peter 4, and verse 8. And since we are running out of time, if you want to jot those down, you can. If we hate someone or have hate in our heart at all, then we can't overcome it. First of all, if we have a problem with someone, we need to pray for the person who is the object of our hate. And we need to try to seek to rectify the problem. 
Have you ever had any situations in your life where you were at odds with somebody and they later on became a good friend? I have, and probably you have too. All of us at one point probably have. I know growing up when I was in school, I had an issue with a couple of boys in school. They would not only pick on me because I was about the littlest fella in my class, but at times they'd take me to the bathroom and one of them would hold me and the other beat me up. Well, one of them ended up moving away of the one that instigated it, and the other one became one of my best friends the next year. So it can happen. We also need to find something good to do for the person who may be the object of hate or resentment. Find something good to do for them. If you see they're having a problem in their life, do something good to help them overcome that. Try to sincerely understand the person who is disliked or resented. Maybe we don't have hate, but maybe we do. But we may need to sit back and think what maybe they're going through. They may be dealing with issues in life that I don't know about. Solomon said, Better is the dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. Proverbs 15, 17. I'm going to close with this quote from Booker T. Washington. He said, I will not allow any man to reduce my soul to the level of hatred. So folks, as we live our lives, we need to live it in peace with our fellow man and love toward our fellow man. The first love toward a fellow man is wanting them to be saved. But that brotherly love, that phileo type love, that we want the best for other people and we want to try to help them. Agape love is we always want the best for them. We want their soul saved. But that brotherly love is we try to treat others like we want to be treated. We don't want to do anything to harm them, to cause them problems or cause them misery in life. We want to treat them with respect and honor and dignity. That's hard sometimes. I'll be the first to admit it. It's hard. Especially in the kind of world we live in today and the kind of people we deal with. There are a lot of people in this world that are hard to love. <laughs> and we all know it. We just have to do our part regardless of what they do. As a child of God, if you're not living the Christian life like you should, then I want to encourage you to make those changes in your life. If you're not faithful as you should be, then repent of those sins. Come back to the Lord do what is right in His sight so that heaven can be your home. If you're here and you're not a Christian, you have the opportunity this morning to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you believe in your heart Jesus is the Son of God, you can come repenting of your sins. And upon repenting of those sins, make the confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and will immerse you in baptism to save you from your sins, to add you to the Lord's church. You live a faithful Christian life then so that heaven will be your eternal home. If you are subject to the Lord's invitation in any way, come right now. Why together we stand and why we sing?